Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Broadway Q&A series brought to you by The Growing Studio and Playbill.com. I'm Jonathan DeVelson, your host. And for to catch up on all of our latest and greatest things, follow us at, at Playbill and at The Growing Studio. I am super, super, super excited for today's guest. Um, we have the artistic director of the Paperville Playhouse, which is my theater home in New Jersey. And we have Mr. Mark Hobie with us today. Are you here, Mark? I'm here. Hello, Mr. Jewelson. Hello. Fun fact, when I was 14 and all pimply and a teenager, <laughs> Mark Hobie decided to let me into the Paper Mill Summer Conservatory, and I had the most amazing summer of my life, twice, in fact, in 2014 and in 2016. I remember very well. I didn't let you in. You earned your way. In. <laughs> very talented, and we had a great couple of years together. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. So how are you doing? Where are you quarantining? Well, I'm at my home right now in Glen Ridge, New Jersey, which is uh, right next to Montclair, about 20 minutes north of Paper Mill. You know, we're all out of the building. Um, we've been out since March. I go in about one day a week to uh, sign checks and do some crazy stuff like that. But we're not <laughs> we're not quiet. We have a lot going on. We um, our restaurants open, Carriage House. Ah, we are serving diners um, uh, Wednesday through Sunday. We have live entertainment Wednesdays, Thursdays, and Saturday nights. We have online education classes. We just finished uh, the conservatory. We did six weeks online uh, conservatory and uh, a Zoom version of the New Voices concert, oh, which wow. is being edited and will air, we think, on September 14th. So it's not quiet. <laughs> That's super exciting. Everybody, make sure you tune into that because yeah. I'm not biased or anything, but the New Voices concert is pretty amazing. It's amazing. It really is a great, great evening of entertainment. And fresh, young, new faces. You started there, Nikki James, Rob McClure. Oh, my God. A uh, lot, a lot of people. Laura Benanti, um, yeah. Anne Hathaway. Just a couple, of, a couple of people, Yeah. <laughs> Have you been? Ali Stroker. Ali Stroker too. Yeah, who just did Oklahoma, right? Yeah, Tony Award winner, Ali Stroker. She started with us, yeah. Amazing. Have you been in Glen Ridge the whole time? Have you gotten to go on vacation or anything? Vacation? What's that? I mean, I don't know. <laughs> we, um, I'm very, very fortunate that my family, uh, my partner and I, my sister, about, uh, I don't know, like 12 years ago, bought a house in Ocean Grove, New Jersey, which is about oh, wow. an hour south near it's right near asbury park so we've been going there on the weekends and spending a little time there but um you know the work never stops last week i was on vacation but i, I was on zoom every day so it's not really vacation. <laughs> that's not really a vacation right <laughs> all right well i would love to get started with these questions and our sure. question is from kate christian in kansas city and she says paper mill is notorious for giving small shows their big start like newsies have you heard of Between the Lines by Jody Picoult and director Jeff Calhoun, and would you consider it bringing to life? And I guess for a better question is, how do you go about finding the new works and bringing them to stage? Sure, and I'll talk actually about Between the Lines because um, I, I know that project very well. Um, oh, awesome. Jeff, I know Jeff Calhoun very well. Jeff, of course, directed Newsies for us. But Jeff and I go way back. We were in school together at Northwestern University. So back in the, you know, 1900s something. <laughs> time. <laughs> right. We were, we were in school together. So we've known each other all since then. Um, and Jeff and actually Daryl Roth brought me between the lines uh, to look at. And we did review it. I thought it was a great piece based on um, Jody's work. Um, but it didn't at that time fit into our schedule and what we had been planning. So it's had another it's had a couple of productions already but it's a great piece i'm sure it will find its way so how do we find new shows oh my gosh it's a lot of different <laughs> we it's interesting um we find a lot of them by attending readings and workshops uh, usually invited by a creative like uh if it andy blankenbuehler were working on a project he invited me to a reading of something last year um, or just producers that we know. We also will get recommended shows. Um, we don't take any unsolicited <laughs> offerings. Like there's a lot of people, everybody's written a musical, 
And a lot of the people try to send them to us. And that's, that's, that's a challenge. We're a very small artistic department, actually. It's myself, our associate um, artistic director, Patrick Parker, half of Chris Slavic, who is our um, associate producer, and half of Stephen Augusto, who I think you may know, who works in education and artistic. So it's a small department. We couldn't possibly read all the material that people would like us to. So uh, we take things that are recommended to us or that we've actually seen pieces of and um, request. Wow. So it, it's it's a variety of ways. And weirdly, not weirdly, <laughs> um, I got a, one of our recent shows that transferred to Broadway was a Bronx Tale. And that came to me, I got an email from Michael David, the producer, as you know, with the Dodgers. And he asked if I would take a meeting with him and talk about the show, and I would. And we were actually recommended to him by Alan Menken. Oh, no because, way. <laughs> right, well, we had done Newsies and a bunch of other shows, and Alan had written the music for A Bronx Tale, and they were looking for a home for uh, A Bronx Tale. I mean, and so he was talking with Michael David and said, have you talked to Mark Kobe and Paper Mill? Because they're great. And, and so, um, you know, you never know where the good stuff's going to come. Yeah, it's such a small world, man. It is. It really is. And it's, and you know, it's about relationships, right? It's yeah. About building a trust with people, having good experience, and then recommending them. Like I'm recommending you to everybody I know as a performer and other things because I've worked with you. No, but it's true, right? And um, that's how shows work. That's how that's how this the whole business works. Yeah. Well, I have a special guest who oh. is a viewer and that wants to come on and ask you a question. So I'm going to bring him on. Great. Let's let's see. It's me. I'm the special guest. Mark is shot yeah. now. <laughs> wow, this is like summer 2014 in like a reunion. I love it. <laughs> you guys were in it together, right? Yeah. That is crazy. I have a memory. I believe Mark is shot now that you had a pool party at your house. That is that's true. In in hold on though, in New Jersey, and I drove my son there, and the whole conversation in the street at like 12.30 at night was about Shanice, who had her final callback for the Wiz Live. And then she went on and got it. <laughs> yeah. But that was at Marcus Shackenau's pool party. The men <laughs> legend. <laughs> <laughs> Marcus, you have a question for us, don't, don't yeah, you? Yeah. So my question is um, currently, in 2020 when things are changing quickly and in a big way culturally and politically, how do you see Paper Mill evolving artistically in the years to come? Well, you know, we've been, um, we've gone through a major change in the last 10 years uh, under my leadership and since our financial crisis um, in 2008. And we've been really lucky that we've been able to make a shift um, and educate our audience to have an appetite for new works. Like they like and want to see and get excited about seeing shows that are in process, right? That are not revivals. Um, and that opens the door for us to bring in new projects, new creatives, new um, uh, directors, all of that. So, you know, um, we already have kind of an open door, which is great. Um, in response to what's happening sort of socially is we are very aware that uh, Paper Mill as an 83-year-old institution has a lot of, of uh, I'd say, growing up to do, right? Responding to the current climate and, and just changing the shape of, of what we see on stage, who our creative teams are, who our staffs are. And we're working pretty diligently about that, all of that right now. I mean, we're just questioning in this moment, that's kind of a pause. I keep saying we're in suspended animation. It's giving us the opportunity to question everything about our organization, the business model, the staffing, the product we put on our stage, um, who our audience is, who our supporters are, funders, individuals, all of that. Um, we're all gonna have to reinvent ourselves moving forward and um, when we come out of this, which I hope will be sooner rather than later, you know, we want to be a reflection of our community. And I've always been one to say we want to invite in as many partners as possible. And that means on every level, right? 
musical theater, you don't do it by yourself. You know, you don't sit in a room and create a show, right? You need a lot of partners. And I think the more partners, uh, the better. So that's that's kind of where we are at this moment in time. Okay. How are you? Where are you? I'm great. I'm in New Orleans. I'm in New Orleans. So yeah, we're doing great. Party town, New Orleans, right? Well, not currently, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Marcus, it was great to see you. Thank you so much for coming on and asking a question. Thanks, When's guys. the next pool party? Not that I was in. <laughs> I didn't go. I was a parent. It is an all-inclusive exclusive. <laughs> you get that invite soon, Mark. Okay. <laughs> great to see you. Great to see you. Bye, Marcus. Well, that was good a blast. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I tend to be good at them. I, what can I say? You guys were also a very good group that year. Those years that you were in it, it was a lot of talent. There was a lot of talent. If I knew, I would have like put on my blush if I knew that I was going to get all these compliments while being on live today, man. <laughs> Your next question is from Greg Yan Yanakura, and he's at home. I don't know where home is, but he says, oh, well, let's, okay, this is a more... Uh, specific question. He goes, what goes into selecting a season and the actors who will be performing in them? Sure. Well, a s selecting a season is very complicated. And for us, I always say there are the shows we would like to do. <laughs> there are the shows we can get the rights to do. And then there are the shows we can afford to do. Um, so, you know, the bottom line is financially, we have to figure it all out. So that is a big piece of the puzzle. Um, in the shows that we would like to do, um, there's titles of revivals that we'd like to, you know, put our own production, our own spin on those productions. And then, of course, these brand new shows, the enhancement deals that come with commercial producers. Now, we're not in control of those. We don't own those projects. So we court them. Um, it's kind of like dating. You meet a <laughs> commercial producer. You see the project. You We like it. Right, we're on the same wavelength about it. it seems like a great piece of uh, musical theater that would be good for our audience. And then we we do kind of go through a little dating process where we get to know each other and do can we work together, right? Uh, do we have the same vision for the show? And then do the finances work? And then do the calendars line up? All of that. So that's one thing. And then the other part of our uh, challenge is that we're so close to New York. It's a blessing and a curse. We're I think 13 miles as the crow flies from Times Square, although that can sometimes take you an hour to get there. Yeah, but, um, there are two hours, who knows? Right. <laughs> but so we have access to great designers, directors, talent. But because we fall within this 25 mile radius of Manhattan, we get shut out of uh, the rights to from licensing houses. So, um, cause we're too close to New York. So if someone has, if there's a show running in New York or on tour, we can't do it until it's done. And if someone has an option on a show that they want to do a revival of, we're shut out. So a little story, I, um, when I first started at Paper Mill, I wasn't running it. I was the associate director in the artistic department then. They said to me, what show would you like to direct? What's the show you'd really like to direct? And this was in the year 2000. I was and I said, how exciting. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I was I was 22. No, I wasn't even that. But I said, I really want to direct West Side Story. I, it was the first show I ever performed in. I did it in college. I really want to do that. So, but because it was on tour, and then because there were two revivals, and it was on tour again, we didn't get the rights to that show until 2016. So it wow. took 16... Now, other theaters all over the country could do it, but because we were so close to New York and someone had the first um, first class rights option, we couldn't get we couldn't get it. So it's it's complicated. And then add into that uh, partnerships with other not for profit regionals. We work on shows together with them. So I think some people think I just sit in my office and write down titles. <laughs> Next year we'll do you know. Color Purple, White Christmas, uh, you know, uh, Benny and June. I wish it was that easy. Um, and we're working on these lineups all the time. Like I'm working already into the 2021, 20, 22 season. 
on the shows and we're getting the rights to revivals that we'd like to produce and talking to creative teams and commercial producers about projects they have that have a long runway to get them up. So it's an ever evolving process. And I typically don't sleep much between November and February because that's the window in which we have to decide. We have to put names on the paper and really start budgeting. And if I told you, typically in, we go into the end of November, it's around Thanksgiving and I have a list of shows that I, I think we might do. And if three of them, two or three of them stay, um, when we announce in February, that's great. They it <laughs> changed, changed a lot. And I always call, we always have this January surprise that sometime in January, we finalized the shows, we budgeted them, and then all of a sudden something falls out of the sky, an opportunity, a new show or a co-production um, that we want to do, and we have to juggle it all around again. So, and on top of that, we also have many segments to our audience, right? We have yeah. very savvy theater goers who go to Broadway all the time and, you know, New York Theater's public roundabout, all those. We have families that are in the suburbs that um, have a variety of ages, you know, from kids to grandparents. And then we also um, really, really speak to young students. So that's a lot of different um, segments of audience to try to please in, in five, five shows. Five shows. <laughs> yeah. It's insane. Yeah. Yeah, it's exciting though. Never dull. Never. No. Well, I have two guests that I would like to bring on to surprise you with if you're okay. if you're Look, around that. I'm up. Oh no. Hi. Hi. Okay, it's Cinderella and the Prince. <laughs> yeah, I thought that would be fun, you know. Oh, I first of all I love you guys, Ashley and Billy. Um, I miss you. They were both on a little talk show I did a, a couple of weeks ago. And they that are two. It was fun, right? Mm -hmm. I have to just say before you talk, two of the most talented, giving, um, just great people and wonderful performers that I've ever worked with. And talk about magic and Cinderella, you know, it's filled with magic, but that's all fake magic, right? That's all stagecraft magic. But there was some real magic that happened in the with that company and with these two leading the way. So. Absolutely. I saw it three times, fun fact. I saw it the first dress rehearsal, and then I saw it on, I think it was, I think I saw it on closing, and I saw it sometime in the middle of the run, and I loved it. Wow. You're a diehard. I, I mean, I try. <laughs> I, I really do. Um, Ashley and Billy, how are you? I'm good. Good. We just, uh, we just drove down to Georgia, so we're kind of exploring out into the world a little bit. Um, so that's exciting. I'm getting to spend some time with my family, and we're going to be down here for about a month, which is really nice. But uh, it's good to get out and um, move to another home base. Yeah. yeah. What about you, Ashley? Oh, me? Oh. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Everything's like, breaking up a little bit, like talking little bits of things. I am working at the Sullivan Street Bakery. I don't know if you guys can see. I'm literally on a break right now. That's a question. But I love working at the bakery. It work, it's like on 52nd, right around the corner from my house. And I was taking my dog. Can you hear me? Yeah. Sorry. I took my dog to the dog park. And I became friends with this guy who was playing with my dog. And he was telling me how he like used to have a hobby with making bread, but now he has this like famous bread place. And I was like, yeah, yeah, whatever. But then he was like, do you wanna, you know, you're, you're waiting for theater to come back. Do you wanna work in my bakery? And I was like, yeah, that sounds amazing. So now that's what I do. I like give out all of his delicious, warm, freshly made bread and it's delicious. That's like the best job, but also so dangerous for me. I feel like <laughs> I would have gained like 30 pounds already. Yeah. Bread is my favorite thing. And I was just in New York. So next time I'm in there for acupuncture, I'm gonna come to the <laughs> I will give you a big old bag of goodies, Mark Hobie. I will give you croissants and bombolonis. It's like Italian delicious bread. Sounds great. Yum. Yeah. Um, Hi. I believe that you two have a question from viewers that you got to ask for a mark. So who wants to go first? I can go first. Go ahead, Bill. 
pull up my question here. Well, Mr. Mark Hobie, <laughs> Bennett Godswell from NYC desperately wants to know, what is your favorite thing you've ever seen at Paper Mill? Uh, well, you mean besides Cinderella? <laughs> uh, obviously besides, that's implied. <laughs> I, you, you know, I've been really blessed to be a part of so many incredible projects. Um, Cinderella really was one that was terrific. Um, Beauty and the Beast and West Side Story that we did uh, were great as well. But I think one of the most special projects I've ever been involved in was Hunchback of Notre Dame that we did with uh, Alan Menken and Stephen Schwartz. It's their only theatrical um, collaboration on stage together. They've done movies and working with Disney Theatrical, who's just an incredible partner. I can't say enough about them, but that show was, I would have watched it every single night. I just was so moved by the story. Incredible cast, Patrick Page, Sierra Renee, uh, Michael Arden, directed by Scott Schwartz. Um, there was something very spiritual about it um, and very theatrical. Uh, you know, sometimes we get overwhelmed by trying to um, create too much on stage. I like more conceptual musicals where the audience has to bring their imagination. And there was a lot of that in that show. And there was something very, um, I mean, because it takes place in a church, right? But it was almost, and we all talk about the theater as a temple, right? There was this really magical marriage about that story, the music, um, and the event. It was one of the highlights of my life, for sure. I saw that. It was absolutely stunning. And the, yeah. the live chorus in the background, the voices, I mean, it, it, was, it was really something very special. Yeah, I mean, when have you been in a musical performance, sometimes in opera and things like that, where there are 50 voices on stage singing to you, this incredible Alan Menken, Stephen Schwartz score um, with really um, emotional music, you know, and really a passionate love story and what about sacrifice and, and about the other, it's all about the other, right? We, we know that being in the theater. I think we all came to the theater because we felt like we were the outsider, right? We were looking for a community, um, but just really great. But that's just one of many, I could go on and on. Yeah. That, was, that was really special. Thank you, Billy Ty, for that question. Well, thank you, Bennett Godswell. <laughs> Ashley, you have a question. Okay, my question is, Jania Addis from Summit, New Jersey, wants to know, do you ever think about doing a season of all new works with all the success you've had when they're done? Yes, and in fact, um, I would love that. Um, the challenge for it is that new works take more time, um, and I mean more time just to get them up, right? We have longer rehearsal periods, longer tech periods, and a longer run. So I don't think in the space of our season, we could actually do five new works in, because we don't have enough time. Um, I also think that the, uh, the staff might kill me because um, as exciting as they are, and they are exciting, there are a lot of work. It takes a, a lot of, like, okay, when you're doing Cinderella, which we did a brand new production of and rediscovered, but the work of putting the show together is done, right? You walk in and you have a score and a script and the, pretty much the show that you start with on day one of rehearsal is the one that's gonna happen on opening night. New works are not like that. They take a lot more attention and rehearsal, but um, I would love to get to the time where we did, I hope the staff is not listening. <laughs> Five new musicals in one season. Wow. Starring Ashley Blanchett and Billy Ty. <laughs> yeah. I like the at least, at I least in that. one of them, right? <laughs> well, I my... can't hear you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. But I think you said something nice. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I said, I want you guys to come back and do a show. That's it. Gladly. Anytime. All right. Um, my last little thing, just because Mark has been handing out the compliments, Billy and Ashley, what is your favorite thing about working with Mark? Oh, this could be a book. <laughs> it's hard to it's hard to narrow this one down. Um, 
I have to say that the thing that I keep talking about to people like on the street, like you got to wear the paper mill, like um, is, is the fact that Mark is so collaborative and he, when you, that's what Billy was going to say too. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, but I feel like I really felt like it was such a rare and wonderful experience to be able to walk in the room and really feel like it was a safe space to be able to create things be able to come up with ideas, to be able to change things and work them out, and to feel like um, we were really walking into a room where that was a safe thing to do from every single person who was in the room, from the creative team down to the the, the, the littlest part to the biggest part. You know what I mean? We, we were all in it um, in, a, in, a, in a safe space where collaboration was important. And so that has been a very rare and special thing for me to experience. And so it, it meant so much to me when we were doing Cinderella. I like, I, I cried when I would come home at night because it was such a, it was such an enjoyable um, therapeutic experience to work with him. Well, Ashley, you and I had several conversations about that. And um, I remember one, our sushi, we had a sushi dinner during the, during the run out in Melbourne. And it was funny because I always say, I don't have all the answers and I expect other people to help me on the journey and find our way together. Um, and I was, I was, it was shocking for me and Billy, I guess we talked about this a little bit too. I don't want to enter to step on your toes, but that that's not always the case in the room. And I think, I think that's sad because uh, then people are missing out. Ashley and Billy both had much better ideas than I did about some of the show. And those ideas got in the show because my goal is to make the best show possible. It's not an ego trip. I mean, I'll make the decisions at the end, but why wouldn't I invite these incredibly talented people to offer their opinions well, and their ideas? It, it's an amazing ability that you have to be able to bring everyone's the best of everyone to the, to the performance. And I, um, I don't think every director has the ability to do that. And it, it's such an important thing for a great director to be able to do. I think you do it so well. And I think that at the end of the day, the show becomes so much better for that because everybody in the cast feels like they actually have contributed something. <laughs> you know, as opposed to I was told to do this here and now I've got to like make it look natural. It's like, oh no, I really did bring some of my soul to this. And so I'm yeah. actually excited to share it even that much more with an audience. And I feel like when you have a piece like that, where everybody really does feel like they've brought some of themselves to it, that they've all, that this is a collaborative, creative experience for everybody, then I think the audience can feel that we really care about what we're giving them. We really, we're really excited to give them something. And I think that makes a huge difference. I mean, what can I add to that? I think you both like took bits of, I was like, okay, well I got Ashley and then Mark went and jumped on my second part of the question. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, it's great because that, that truly is the answer. It's it's the best answer and it's the, the most concise answer to what we're trying to get at is paper mill is fun and that's because of the environment that you create. Because you have a level of humility about you that allows actors to bring their ideas to the sandbox. And when we're able to play the, the good ideas and the creativity isn't stifled. And like you had said many times, the best idea wins and you're not always going to have the best idea. And that's not because you don't think well of your skills as a director. You're obviously a very successful and amazing director. But what you're doing is you're allowing other creative people in the room to, to contribute. And then those contributions, we create a show together. At the end of the day, it's not just your show. It's and, and you pass the show off to us eventually anyway. So if we feel like we're a part of that contribution and a part of that collaboration, it's just 30, 40, 50 minds working together to create the best product for your audiences. You know, and, and I, well, you're, very, you're both so sweet. And Ashley and I talked about this both, too, about, you know, I was a, a dancer. That's how I started. And I, I've said this before, but in the totem pole of um, show business, you know, the dancers are you know, sort of on the bottom. And there were many productions that I did that I I wasn't even sure that some of the people on the creative team knew who I was. Um, and so I think that's important because you want, look, everybody is asked to do so much and invest so much. And Ashley said it, I think the audience can feel it when the, when the, um, when the whole 
company loves doing what they're doing and owns it because they've helped create it. Um, I think there's a, a joy and a cohesiveness to the piece that, you know, comes right out into the audience. I think it really does. Agreed. Very special. Uh, yeah. I agree. You guys are special. Yeah. <laughs> well, guys, thank you so much for joining us today. It was a pleasure to have you both. Oh, you. made my day. Yes. I'm going to the Sullivan Bakery. Uh, Me too. On, everybody. I will give everybody who comes and says the name Mark Hobie some free special treat. <laughs> Oh, you guys better wow. have down there. I don't know if you're endorsed by that, but hey, that's amazing. Uh, so great to see you both. Yeah, you, too. you guys you too. have a good one. Thank Bye. you for having us. Bye. Now, I mean, I said I was good with surprises, right? Those were great. But I got to say, um, I Ashley had worked for us before she had done Ever After. Um, but I, I didn't direct that show, so I didn't, you know, I knew her, but we had never worked together. And Billy was brand new to me. They both came into the audition process, and I said, oh, well, that's Cinderella, the, the prince. And we had a, an incredible time working together. Um, they're, they're exactly those kind of people that you saw there on the screen. Fun, open, energetic, and and talented, and just really, really full of, full of love. I mean, great, great people. Good choice. I mean, I, I try. Um, your next question, since we were talking about Hunchback, is from Landon Smelter in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and he wants to know what was the process for designing and constructing the set for No Hunchback. Well, that was Alexander Dodge who um, designed that set, and it was so exciting. And the um, it was a challenge. We were we partnered with that with La Jolla Playhouse out in California, so Disney theatrical was the commercial entity and producer, uh, and then it was a collaboration between La Jolla Playhouse and Paper Mill. It started in La Jolla and then moved to Paper Mill. So that's always a challenge for a designer because two spaces that are somehow different that have to deliver the same piece. And um, Scott Schwartz was, the director was so intent on getting a community element into the show. There are only really about 18, uh, cast members, but then there was a cast, there was a, a choir of 36 people on stage every night. Um, is that right, 36, Some or 32, eight times four is 32, 32. Um, <laughs> but so providing an environment that was a church that echoes Notre Dame that has these huge bells. It's a bell tower, also can morph into different places that the show needs to take you and to have this community element of 32 choir members on stage the entire time was quite a mountain for uh, the design team to climb. And Alexander did it beautifully. It went through several iterations as any set design does, but it was fantastic. And we were just talking about this the other day for anybody who saw the show, there was a huge bell, I don't know what you call it, arbor that came in with these enormous life-size bells from Notre Dame. That, that whole thing weighed three tons. And the bells that moved were actually synced with a computer to sound effects so that when the bell swung and the clapper hit the bell, that's what set off the, um, echoing sound in the chamber. And Gareth Owen, who's from uh, Germany, was the sound designer, and he added a, a bunch of surround sound into our theater. So when those bells rung, it was, it shook the rafters, I guess. You know. <laughs> um, but yeah, Alexander did an incredible job. Uh, That's amazing. With, with the, the creating that environment. It seems like that for specifically that project, it was extremely collaborative, like on all levels to kind of make the show what it was. And it was a departure kind of from uh, some of the typical Disney product. It wasn't, you know, it's not a happy story, you know, Esmeralda ends up dying and uh, you know, there's, there's death in the show and there's heartbreak, um, but they were very committed to telling the the story that was birthed out of the novel, right, mm -hmm. and um, and getting all the great uh, 
Alan Menken, Stephen Schwartz music in it and the characters that were created for the Disney animated film, but but having this um, live experience that was much deeper than that. And I think that's why it resonated. People still talk about it. I, I still am emotional just like thinking about it, but um, yeah, it was great. Really, really. That's great. Well, I have one more guest that I would okay. like to, on to ask a question. You may or may not know them. I don't really know. All right, let's see. <laughs> Hannah Skoken, come on. You definitely know me. I know Hannah from, okay. Hannah's another former student of ours who's now a professional actress, but were you like 10? I was 10. Our, our summer musical theater conservatory, which is a professional training ground, audition based as you guys know, but just for anybody who's listening, um, we have about 120 students between the ages of 10 and 18. You can do it from 10 until the summer after your senior year in high school. And, and there are a lot, how many years did you do it? Did you? I did it every single year. <laughs> eight, eight or nine eight years. years. Yeah, and then I interned the year after it. So technically nine years. So then you had a good time, I guess you enjoyed it. I had the best time. And to this day, I like owe the conservatory my entire life of like how I am as a performer and as a person and my best friends. And like, I cannot talk more highly of. <laughs> It, it's an intense experience, um, but for people who are really, for students who are really focused on a career in theater, it's kind of the best musical theater training uh, around. Um, it's five intensive weeks from nine to five and all disciplines, right? Stage combat, mime, monologue, and then culminates with this huge performance on stage of paper, fully choreographed stage, as you guys know, mm -hmm. costume, lit. It's, we, we say we do five shows a year in our main stage season. But for me, we do six shows a year because that show is as big a production as anything else we do all year. Um, now, you guys must have been in it together then too. Absolutely. Were you at the pool party with Marcus Jack? Of course, I was at every we pool all, party. And we all found out about Shanice and the Wiz. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, but. To this day, I still like have a um, the Oh What A Night shoe bop arms like in oh, yeah. my brain, like I can never forget it. Oh, this move? Oh yeah, <laughs> the specificity <laughs> mark. Yeah. yeah. I remember, cause I was always in charge of the staging, not really choreographing, it was more staging, the group numbers when there's 120 students yeah. on stage. Those and making sure that every parent can see every child's face and that everybody's in the front line at one point. Yeah, it's like, I think of it more like marching band than actually dancing. Literally. But, um, yeah. And Mark, let me tell you, to this day, I actually choreographed a bunch of shows when I was uh, at Montclair in Glenridge oh. at Ridgewood Ave School. Um, and I think I had maybe like uh, 50 or 60 kids. And I thought, well, if Mark Kobe could do it with a hundred and like six of us, then I have nothing to complain about, man. <laughs> but, you know, you do, you have to adapt your talent to the environment and to who you're working with, right? And when we were working, and we do it every summer, we didn't do it this summer, it was virtual, but 120 kids, like when Hannah started, she was 10. And when somebody who's just ready to go off to college, they have a much different skill set and ability to learn biography and be focused and all of that. So you have to figure out, and it took me many years to figure out what kind of choreography everybody can do and look good, right? And then it's clean and it, it doesn't have to be complicated. It can be simple. I mean, when 120 people do one gesture, as long as it's all the same, that's impressive, right? So sometimes less is more. Yeah. Absolutely. Hannah, you have a question for Mark. I do. Um, it's pretty apropos. Um, how has your education influenced your career first as a performer and then as an artistic director? Well, you know, I, I studied, I went to school, and I think that's very important. I'm a big advocate of uh, higher education and that everybody should get a college degree, if you can, if the opportunity is there for you and if you can afford it. I just think that sets you up um, in life better for a career in the theater or if you choose to switch careers after a while. So I went to Northwestern University outside Chicago and had a terrific experience there, studied, learned a lot about myself, um, so I'm a big proponent of arts education. I didn't have much growing up. You know, it was a different era. I did musicals in high school, but they weren't like now, 
like the Rising Star Awards that we do that celebrate excellence in high school theater in New Jersey. When I see some of those productions, I'm just blown away. And I think now, I don't know that I'd have much of a career now because the kids that are arriving in New York now are much more honed and polished than when I got off the bus from Chicago. But um, Paper Mill, I, I've been working at Paper Mill now for 20 years and been running it for about 11. And the education programs, I'm a huge advocate of them. I love them. And not only because, but maybe partly because I'm a dad too. I have two kids. And my son went through the conservatory with you guys. He was in it for, he did it, I think, for seven or eight years. And um, for for kids who don't have the benefit of like organized sports, which is team building, right? Being a cog in a machine, understanding what that is, having a group, developing friendships. I think that arts does those similar things, gives people a home base, makes them feel comfortable, gives them friends, but it also provides what you don't sometimes get in sports, which is empathy right and the understanding of what it means to work together on an emotional level um, and all of that benefits any career you follow i always say that our success stories are not always the anne hathaways who win the you know academy award right that's brilliant but those aren't the kids who really need the education programs we we are doing or who will benefit the most. She was going to make it whether she came to Paper Mill or not. Right? So let's be real. But there are a lot of kids probably who went through the conservatory with you who don't wind up choosing a career in show business, but they still understand better who they are as individuals, how to express themselves uh, and their emotions, how to communicate, how to work in a group how to um, compromise and collaborate, you know, and all of those are skills you need in any career, right? Um, I always think about auditioning and, and likening it to interviewing for a job, right? You, you have to go in and promote yourself and present your best self, even if you're applying for a, you know, a administrative position at a law firm. It's the same skills about how do you uh, pr put your best self forward. So I think the arts and arts education and starting at really young is so important. Um, yes, for the kids, or for those young people who are, I keep saying kids, for those young people who want to follow a career in that, but also for developing just, I think, better human beings. You know? Totally. Well, I just and graduated from college, if you could believe it. So I cannot. <laughs> were, you, were you at NYU? Or? I was at Pace. My pace. I knew it was in New York City. Yeah. yeah. So wow. great time to enter the world of show business. Yeah. Right. Well, you know, every lesson I learned as a conservatory student, like, has carried me into college and hopefully beyond. So. And the idea about focus, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, really uh, self motivation, which is so much a part of being a performer, right? No one sits there and is going to hand you every piece of uh, work you need to do. You have to memorize your lines on your own. You have to work, woodshed all of those harmonies. You, there's a lot of stuff. You have to work on your own choreography so when you come back to the rehearsal, you know it and you can expand upon it. That kind of work ethic is great for any career, you know? Um, and. I think creative people, that's why they're sought out in other industries, because they come with lots of ideas. Mm -hmm. They understand how to focus. They understand how to work with a team. Um, all of those things I think you learn through the arts. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Kind of spoken. Oh my gosh, it's story yeah. on Broadway sometime soon. Oh, from yeah, your for sure, ideas. folks. Make sure you know who she is, man. Well, I'll tell you this. I have a very strong memory of Hannah Skoken when I think she was 10 or and she opened her mouth to sing. And the voice that came out of that little girl felt like a 30-year-old woman. And Thank you. It Thank was you. through the warmth, emotion, depth, in a way that some of the other nasally little kids who hadn't you know, sort of matured yet, um, you know, it was different. You had something very unique about you. And so I, I hope that other people are going to recognize that as well and that you'll have a long career.
Well, thank you. You're going to make me cry on Playboy Live here, but <laughs> that means a lot coming from you. I look up to you for days to come. So It was true. It's very true. Yeah. Great to see you. Thank you. Thank you for being a surprise guest. Oh, yeah. Me and Marcus, what a squad. <laughs> Johnny. <laughs> thank you, Hannah, so much for joining us. I hope to see you soon. Take care. Okay, bye, guys. Take care. Bye. Stay safe and healthy up here and everywhere else. Everybody has you, too. Yep. Johnny. Good, I mean, good I, I'm doing it, right? I, I mean, surprise. And I would just like to say that it is a testament to you that I was able to ask if someone wants to come on live and a million people were willing to come and just talk about how great you are. Oh. And I can say that uh, my experience at Pyramid, what I loved is that you never ever treated us like kids. You treated us like professionals and you didn't hide anything from us. I got to learn what was happening with the lights. And it, when something went wrong, we all stood on stage and we watched you get to deal with it with grace effervescently. And that's something I really appreciate. Uh, just like going on through life and like it taught me like to have respect for everybody in the theater no matter what job they're doing and it's so isn't that true we talk about that all the time two things one is that i think in your learning process of becoming a performer you should understand what a stage manager does and what a lighting designer does costume designer what the crew is doing you don't have to do each one of those roles but every one of those people is important the musical director the the musicians to supporting what's happening on stage right if you're the performer on stage and you don't have lights and an orchestra playing and someone calling the cues you're standing in the dark right and an appreciation and an understanding for what those people are doing i think is so important um it, it makes you a better performer and the other thing i think you said which i believe fully in is that we treat the students in that conservatory program like professionals from it doesn't matter whether they're 10 or 18 we expect the same work you know i mean we're a little more forgiving for the 10 year olds right but but we ask we, we ask the same commitment the same dedication and then when we get on stage we're very specific about you know it's a union house and this is what is expected of you and um you know i i think that's important it's important for us to treat kids like those kids like professionals like adults because we're asking them to give that back to us and it shows in the performance it shows people are blown away by um, by the stuff that you and hannah and marcus and shanice and all of those those young people do at that level performing at that level absolutely well my final question for you um, it's going to be from me. And I want to know, what do you see for, or what would you like to see for Paper Mill in the upcoming years as it continues to grow? Oh, we have a lot of dreams, actually, <laughs> for Paper Mill. Um, I feel so lucky. Uh, we, we were right until coronavirus and everything that's shut down the country at this moment. We were riding an incredible wave. Um, this year was was looking like it was going to be our eighth year in the black with a surplus financially, uh, which is incredible for a not-for-profit regional theater. I think. Um, excuse me. We, um, you know, had had. I think I I can't remember. I've lost count how many world premieres and American premiere shows that we've done under my leadership. It, it's somewhere in the twenties, twenties, twenty and thirty. Moved four shows to Broadway. Uh, on national tours, um, you know, international productions, Hunchbacks being done all over the world. So that's thrilling. Um, what I would like to see is growth in the organization. And we have plans. We'd like to expand the theater um, into the town of Melbourne. Well, we just, we, on March 3rd, right before everything shut down, we had opened the Paper Mill Studios downtown two brand new beautiful studios to expand the education programs. No one's ever used them. <laughs> they've, been, they've been closed because a week later, coronavirus shut down the country. But we'd like to have a bigger footprint downtown, become a cultural corridor um, into the town of Milburn. And that's two, it has two reasons. One, it's to, to grow our education programs, really, but then also to really be more engaged with the community. And when I say the community, I mean, of course, 
Melbourne Short Hills, but also Essex County and the state of New Jersey. I feel like we've done a good job actually exporting our product, our artistic product to the world. And um, now we wanna really make sure we're doing that good a job with the relevance we have to our community. And a lot of that is through the education and outreach programs and, um, and access. You know this, we're a big leader in access. We're the first theater in the country to do a comprehensive autism friendly performance and led the charge with, with that. And um, we wanna expand that as well. We'd like to be a teaching hub. Um, Lisa Cooney who runs the education department. We always dreamed of bringing- That woman, love her to death. Amazing, that whole department's great. Um, bringing teachers who uh, are mainstream teachers, but also teachers who deal with special needs kids to paper mill, to train them how to deliver the arts to that community that has so many challenges because we've seen the incredible growth that happened. So that's, that's a goal too. So lots, lots of, lots of possibilities when we all get on the other side of this dark moment. That's amazing. Well, Mark, thank you so much for joining us today. It is absolutely my pleasure to have you on here and get to interview you and talk about all the, th the great things that you're doing. I know that Paper Mill is such, it's a starter for a lot of people, um, particularly in the New Jersey area, just like seeing their, even their first show at the Paper Mill yeah. Play. It's my great honor that what, one of the things that I never knew I would wind up doing because I started as a dancer was to have a, a platform like this to launch careers and to have people on their careers and i'm thrilled to be on the opposite end of this camera with you you're you're the boss now you're my boss today <laughs> just a little bit <laughs> well thank you so much i hope you have the, a wonderful rest of your day and that you're staying safe uh with your family i loved being here and i will say hi to them thank you for having me on absolutely thank you Thank you everybody so much for joining us with the Broadway Q&A series today. Um, tune in on Friday where we have our college questionnaire uh, series and I will see you guys soon.